Well, greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ, children of the household of the eternal God, Yahweh. Warm hello to all of you who worship our King, and as I often call him, Yeshua, or some of you prefer Jesus. Please be sure you listen to the previous sermon first before hearing this one. Something really cute happened on Thanksgiving Day. We were, uh, Tom, our son-in-law, had just asked a very heartfelt blessing over the meal, and uh, we're getting ready to start eating. We're dishing out the food and everything, and uh, he had thanked our dear Father in heaven for his many blessings and how thankful we were. The prayer was all about being thankful. And then their three-year-old daughter, Juliana, uh, started asking each person around the table without being prompted, and what are you thankful for, Mama? And she would answer, and what are you thankful for, Papa, her dad? And finally came to me, what are you thankful for, Poppy? And I gave my answer. She particularly perked up when her grandmother, my wife, Nan, as she calls her, said, I'm especially thankful for two wonderful little girls God has given us named Juliana and Odessa. Well, she was happy to have that, but it got me thinking, what am I thankful for? And I, so I take a cue from my granddaughter, Juliana, or Jules as we call her, and I ask each of you today, and what are you thankful for? Well, there's so many things we can be thankful for. It's not a sermon on thankfulness, but I want to start with that because I am. So, you know, you probably have too. We've messed up our lives. I've messed up my life in the past from time to time, and I can't tell you how excited I am, how grateful I am, how thankful I am for the wonderful gift that we just don't talk about that much, a gift we can have by faith, the very righteousness of God himself, of Yahweh himself, through the Messiah, credited to me and to you as our very own righteousness. We covered that last time. Last time I explained a seldom taught concept in some Church of God circles or even Messianic groups. Uh, we've all heard a lot about the gift of God's grace and the pardon of our sin debt by the death of the Son of God for us. But the Father goes beyond that with a seldom taught gift that really is part of grace but not really explained properly or even mentioned. The gift of His, God, Yahweh's very own perfect, holy righteousness credited to us by faith. King James says reckoned. Uh, New King James, others say imputed or credited. This goes beyond the forgiveness of sins that had been previously committed. This shows us the way going forward. How we're going to be deemed righteous enough to be in the perfect kingdom of God. How are we? No matter how hard we try, because we're all sooner or later going to fail. We're going to sin again, aren't we? So it's an important topic because no one who is at any level of unrighteousness will be in the Father's kingdom, for there will be no unrighteous in the kingdom, it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And yet, from time to time, you and I do unrighteous things, still. And our best efforts at human moral excellence is, in God's eyes, filthy rags. He says that in Isaiah 64, verse 6. So are you seeing the problem? We're forgiven for our past sins, but going forward, it's kind of like a landmine if we think we have to be perfect from here to the point of the return of Messiah. It's like walking through a field full of landmines. We're going to hit one sin sooner or later. I think it's a vital concept. Please hear this. There will be but one level of righteousness in the kingdom of God. One. Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, said we have to exceed the Judaistic meticulous righteousness, so-called, of the legalistic Pharisees. The one acceptable righteousness will be the sinless, 100% perfect, holy performance of the Son of God, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And that is what he's offering us. But how does his righteousness affect you and me? It's also understood and explained in context of being the body, the very body of the Messiah, as his bride. Now, this is important, what I'm about to say here. The bride of Christ is part of him, just as surely as the bride of Adam was part of his body. Romans 5.14, it talks about the first Adam. Romans 5.14, who is a type of him who was to come. 
And then in 1 Corinthians 15:45 it says, as it was written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam, referring to Jesus or Yeshua, became a life-giving spirit. Call him Yeshua because that's the Hebrew name that I'm sure he was called by. And uh, anyway, but I'll, I'll use both from time to time. There are Messianics who hear this. There are there are Christians who hear this. Um, Eve, Hava in the Hebrew, was not created separately from the dust of the ground as Adam had been. Remember that. And yet she had her own personality. She had her own existence. Nor are we being formed separately, at least as the Father sees it, but as part of the body of Yeshua, who is called the last Adam or the second Adam. And yet, like Eve, we too have our separate personalities and existence. I mean, you're there and I'm here, all alive. We have different strengths and weaknesses, different functions in the body. And so, you know, I've talked a lot about it, but we are part of the body of Christ, of Messiah. We're all part of him, providing different functions, as it says in Romans 12, verses 4 and 5, and should be even be considered as one with one another. We're a part of one body together, and surely we're going to start to see it happen and act like one body. Someday, someday, brethren, are we ever going to really come together? I think one of the biggest things that keep us apart is this false teaching that all the organizations are branches off, off the vine. That's not what Yeshua, our Savior, said. He said, you are the branches. You individuals are the branches. Not the organizations. That's a, that's a tricky little way of keeping us apart. But those branches still come together in the vine. Let me make a pitch for how the one body of believers will happen again. The way we're going to ever be one is in him, according to John 17, 21. Let that percolate in you for a bit. That they may be one, Father, in us. That they may be one in us. Now, would anyone say that any parts of the body of the Son of God, his literal body, resurrected literal body, is anything but holy? What implications does that hold for you and me? Well, some may be an arm, some may be a leg, some may be a uh, backbone, some may be a toe, whatever. We're part of that holy body. And that is why we're called hagios in the Greek, holy one, saints, through the scriptures. Because he is holy. And he is in us. And we are in him. That makes us holy. It has to do with really understanding, I think, this one body of how this righteousness of God is going to affect us. If you turn to Genesis 2, verses 23-24, Eve had just been created. Adam and Eve were from one flesh, two separate personalities. But becoming one, even though it had come out of one body, becoming one again was going to become a process. It says in Genesis 2, 23-24, Adam, a red dirt, that's what it means, uh, said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's a process. Becoming one even with our Father and with Jesus Christ is a process. It takes time. We're being called to be one with the Son of God, who is very different from us. And we're also called to be one with one another. Adam and Eve came from one body. Now they were two. They shall become one again. Truly, being one goes beyond the marital act of love. Anyone married knows exactly that becoming one or being one with your spouse takes time, a lot of effort, a lot of surrendering, a lot of prayer, a lot of humility. It's frankly a miracle if it ever happens, but it does happen. In the same way, we are one spirit with our second Adam, Yeshua. But this time, instead of one flesh, we are one spirit with him. Now, in a, in a way, it's a crucial concept to understand and grasp. You can read that in 1 Corinthians six seventeen, a verse I don't often hear. I've never heard expounded, frankly. Maybe it is being expounded somewhere. 1 Corinthians six seventeen, But anyone joined to the Lord, to the Master is one spirit with him. You're joined to master, you're one 
spirit with him. And the, and the context he's giving is don't be uh, fooling around with prostitutes, harlots, because know you not that he who is joined to a harlot has become one flesh with her. Then he goes on in verse 17, in the same way, if you're joined to Yeshua, to the master, you are one spirit with him. So being in him and part of his body is far more than just being part of the church. It includes that, but has far, far deeper ramifications. We're experiencing the Son of God by being in him. And, for example, Paul teaches that we, when, that we literally died with him in crucifixion since we're part of his body. And, and also since he was resurrected and now sits at the right hand of God, we, in a sense, as he says in Ephesians 2.6, we, in a sense, he says, are, have been raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in, Mes in Messiah Yeshua. <clears throat> We've been raised together. We sit together with him. So today I'm going deeper into this. We're going to continue discussing what we, what we just said, but also uh, how we must become witnesses <clears throat> to his resurrection in our lives in a very, very real way when we ask him to come into us and let us be part of him. We have to get ourselves out of the way and let him live his righteousness in our lives. We'll have much more on that, on living in God's righteousness. If you want a title for the sermon, Living in God's Righteousness. And, uh, excuse me, just a second. And uh, we'll also talk about bearing the fruits of the Savior's righteousness versus fruit of our own failed efforts at goodness and righteousness. There is a massive difference. Ultimately, I think a lot of this has to do, this letting him live in us, uh, with a, a sense of becoming more and more intimate with our Father and with, our, with the Son of God, our, our, our husband-to-be, knowing that you're coming to love him more and more each day. It's an intimate, close bond. And uh, he is our life now. And you and I are literally falling in love more and more with our King. For in this group dynamic, we're in the role of bride. He is the husband. That's much, much more to do with our hearts than it has to do with a form of religion or the appearance of religion. It has to do with how much we love him and love the Father and love the body, which is other fellow believers. And that's the best part of life is having all these awesome relationships, being able to be with your grandkids, at least half my grandkids, the other half were across the country, but these are things and the times we remember, fun and wonderful relationships. Now, a quick recap before we go on of last time. Let me take 10 minutes or so to recap last time. We should do a, re a recap before moving on. We have a choice. Either be perfectly righteous and qualify for the kingdom on our own, or accept life going forward um, with Jesus' imputed righteousness to cover us. That's what Romans chapters 2, 3, and 4 are all about. You can be justified by works if you obey perfectly. But as he goes on to say in Romans 2 and 3, but no one ever has except Jesus Christ. So God offers his grace to forgive us. We accept it. Our sin debt's canceled. But that puts us back to a zero balance. All our debt is gone. But going forward, we have no assets. Going forward, what are we going to do? So God offers us another gift, the gift of his very own righteousness, which we accept by faith. We're going to read all the verses on it. It's a faith in the righteousness of God in Yeshua. It's the standard of the kingdom of God. It's nothing less. I want that to really be understood. There is one level of righteousness that will be found in the, king, in the kingdom of God. That is the very righteousness of Yahweh himself. Nothing less. Paul states clearly his choice, if you could have the very best that you could perform or the very best of kind of righteousness that God the Father has, which would you pick? Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11. Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11. If any of you are, are um, uh, just hearing it by, by voice, I, I recommend you print off the audio, I mean print off the transcript and listen to the audio while you go through the transcript as well. Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11, Be found in him, not having my own righteousness. That's what I want more than anything else uh, Paul is saying. Not having my own righteousness, which is from Torah, which is from the law. I don't want that righteousness from Torah. Let that sink in, brethren. 
I want the righteousness that is through faith in Messiah, in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And he goes on from there. So that's the righteousness Paul wanted, and he said it was available by faith. He says the righteousness from God by faith. Then in Romans 3, verses 20 to 23, Romans 3, verses 20 to 23, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God... Get this now, Romans 3.21. Now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, in Yeshua Messiah, to all and all on all, all to all and on all who believe. There's no difference whether Jew or Gentile, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So you see, I don't agree with those who say this imputed righteousness is a New Testament gift but not found in the Old Testament. Paul himself says that it was imputed righteousness that saved Abraham. He quoted that in uh, quoting Genesis 15, 6, and you find that in Romans 4 and 5. There's only one perfect, acceptable righteousness, Yahweh's own. And uh, it's the very same righteousness that Abel had, that Enoch had, that Noah had, that Abraham, David, and Isaac, Isaiah had, and Jeremiah had and spoke of, it's going to be the same level of righteousness that all who will be in the kingdom will have. Noah, for that matter, in fact, I, I mentioned that because it says in verse 21, Romans 3:21, the last part of it, look at that again. It, it says this, Righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Being witnessed, what? The righteousness of God was being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So they certainly knew about it. So how do we acquire this level of God's righteousness? Noah, remember, became an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. David spoke of my tongue, shall speak of your righteousness. And uh, uh, Isaiah talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it. And so how do we acquire this level? Now go to Romans 5, verses 17 to 19. Again, I just wish we would talk about this, preach about this far more than we ever do. Romans, we, we accept it in faith after repenting and confessing Yeshua as our Lord and Master and Savior. Romans 5, verses 17 to 19. For if by one man's offense... Death reigned through the one, that's Adam. Much more those, in other words, when Adam sinned, the whole human race was thrown out of the garden. Much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Boy, we talk about the gift of God's grace, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of love. We talk about all kinds of gifts and the gifts of the Spirit and the gifts of the fruit of the Spirit and all kinds of things. Whoever talks about the gift of righteousness. It's right there. Romans 5.17. And of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, that was through Adam's sin. Even so, through one man's righteous act, Yeshua's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, the free gift of what? He's talking about the gift of righteousness. Came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, that was Adam's disobedience, many were made sinner, sinners, so also by one man, Jesus, also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. You will be made righteous by his obedience. I will be made righteous by his obedience. Now how does that work out? A lot of Protestants will, will teach you that that means it's all done. It's all done, finished on the cross, at the resurrection. Every, it was all done. And there's nothing more to do. You can do whatever you like, and, and you're saved. Once saved, always saved. Well, let's keep reading and keep hearing, because though I deeply believe in the gift of righteousness imputed to us by God, 
And I deeply want that. And I teach that here. I do not believe that that's what he is saying here, that we have nothing else to do. We have to, a lot to do, and what we have to do is, in a nutshell, get ourselves out of the way and let him live again. And he's going to live righteously. He's going to live righteously in us, lovingly in us, if we get ourselves out of the way. Now in Romans 4, go back to Romans 4, verses 23 to 24. We're doing a quick recap here. We're going to be done here in about four minutes. Now it was not written, done with the recap, I mean. Romans 4, 23, 24. Now it was not done, or not written for his sake alone, for Abraham's sake alone, that righteousness was imputed to him, that it righteousness was imputed, but also for us. It shall also be imputed to us, not just Abraham, but also to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So it's very clear, this teaching is very clear. Now last time we talked about the big swap, how God takes our sins, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.21, how God takes our sins and we take his righteousness, or we're, we accept his righteousness. Uh, he became a sin offering for us, and we become the righteousness of God in him. He gets us, and we get him. Boy, brethren, it doesn't get any better than that. He gets us, and we get him. That's a swap, all right. And uh, turn to Second Corinthians 5.21. We give him our dead body. And he gives us a glorious new body to be revealed in the resurrection. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, be the sin offering for us. He never, he never sinned, and he never uh, was considered sinful. He paid the penalty. He became the sin offering for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I want you to notice how many dozens and dozens of times it talks about being in him or in Christ or in God. And that in him concept is much, much deeper than I think we, we superficially understand it. I've spoken about it for years now, and I think it's crucial to understanding if we're not in him, we have no future. We have to understand what in him means. You go back in my website. There are many, many sermons I've given about it. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul ends up the chapter speaking. <clears throat> Paul ends up the chapter speaking about how Yahweh called weak people. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 30 to 31. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God, and who became for us the righteousness. Sanctification and redemption, so that it's written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. It should really be exciting to us if we really understand it. John, his Hebrew name was Johannan. John the baptizer said so much in just one sentence about his new relationship. John 3, verse 30. This is the summary of it all. He must increase. I must decrease. In my life, people should see more and more of Yeshua and less and less of Philip Shields. He must increase. I must decrease. Therefore, we no longer live for sin, but for righteousness, Paul goes on to say in Romans 6, verses 5 to 14, Yeshua becomes the author of salvation for all who believe and who obey him. It says in Hebrews 5, 9, he becomes the author of salvation to all who believe and obey him. There is obedience required. There is. We're going to go into a little different topic here now, which still explains how we accept and live by God's righteousness. Philippians 3.10. There's a phrase that Paul uses here that I have to admit I did not understand until more recently. I've spoken, I've read the words many, many dozens of times. It's one of my favorite scriptures. In Philippians 3, verse 9 and 10, let's read Philippians 3, 10, because this is how it happens. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. 
I kind of read over that and said, Paul's just saying that I may know him so that I can someday be resurrected. That's not at all what he's saying. He's saying that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Then he goes on to say that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. How will we know the power of his resurrection? There's a clue given in 2 Timothy 3.5. He speaks of people in the end time in 2 Timothy 3.5. Before this, he says there'll be lovers of pleasures and disrespectful to parents and all kinds of things. And then he says this in 2 Timothy 3.5, having a form of godliness, they'll look religious, they'll look godly, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, but denying its power. From such people turn away. Turn now to Colossians 3. So you can look godly on the outside, but be denying the power of that very godliness. Denying the life of the risen Yeshua. Denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 3 and 4, for you died. And Romans 6 says we died in the, with him in crucifixion. Our, our baptism pictures that. You died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. I'm actually in God the Father as well, and so are you. Me, even sinful me, am in, am, am in the Father. How is that even possible? It's possible because Jesus forgave me, cleansed me, made me part of his body, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he was in the Father, and because I am now in Christ, I am in the Father that way. And so that's what he says. You died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear also with him in glory. Christ, our life. Wow. We have trouble letting go of the old self a lot of times. Christ, our life. We have to get ourselves out of the old, our old selves out of the way. There's a type given if you turn to Numbers 32. Some imagery in the Old Testament which demonstrates this for us. You know they had these 12 scouts, spies that they put together, one from each tribe. And Moses sent them in to spy out the land and come back with reports about how good it was. He thought that might probably encourage everybody, imagine, and give them an idea of what to expect. Well, it didn't work out that way. Ten of them came back with very discouraged, discouraging testimony. And they turned the people's hearts from wanting to go in. Joshua was saying, come on, let's go in. The land's there before us. Let's arise and go. Let's claim it. And that should be the attitude we should have about the coming kingdom of God. Come on, we can do it with God's, God's power, God leading us, God, God's righteousness, God's life. Yeah, we can, we can, there's nothing to be afraid of. But they talked about the giant problems ahead of them in the land. And we have giant problems and we get discouraged. So in Numbers 32, verses 10 to 14, whenever it says the Lord in big capital letters, I'm going to say what the original Hebrew said, Yahweh. The Lord doesn't say much to you about, you know, so I'm going to say Yahweh. It means the eternal God, the eternal one. Yahweh, that was his name. And so Yahweh's anger was aroused on that day, and he swore an oath, saying, Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt from twenty years and above shall see the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and he said, Except Caleb, and except Yeshua, Joshua, the son of Nun. We say none, but it's Nun, for they have wholly followed Yahweh. So Yahweh's anger was aroused against Israel. He made them wander in the wilderness for forty years. That was recorded for our admonition. That was the picture. We have to let our old self die, and we have to be a new creation, and let that new creation become like a little child going into the promised land. Child in heart, that is. Simple faith that a little child has. Matthew 18, 3. And Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you're converted and become as little children, you shall by no ways and no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So eternal God must produce a new life in us. Our old generation, the old way, has to die, just like it did in the wilderness. And uh, we have to let the new life, the little child, the new creation spring up in us. Well, there's much more. We're also called, we read in Philippians 3.10, to be, he says, I want to, he says, I want to, uh, how do he put it there? 
and that I may know the power of his resurrection. We're actually called to be witnesses of him and of his resurrection by witnessing to the power of his resurrection. In fact, those in the very end time, we think of wit the witnesses of Jesus, we think of people who saw him risen from the dead as being his witnesses, the apostles and so forth. They could bear witness to having seen and talked and been with the risen Christ. You know what? You and I are called to be witnesses of the risen Christ as well. Do you hear that being preached? Yes, we are, brethren, called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. And for that, we're going to be beheaded, it says in Romans 20, verse 4. Unless we're divinely protected, that may be well some of us here. But okay, you and I didn't see him die on the tree or, on the, or that stake on the hill. You and I didn't peer into the empty garden tomb after our Lord was resurrected. I have been to a garden tomb in Jerusalem, and it is empty. I don't know if that was his garden tomb. I found it exciting even just seeing that. But you and I didn't have a radiant angel telling us he was alive again. You and I didn't walk with him on the road to Emmaus to see the Messiah rise or see him rise up in the air. No. And yet we're still called to be witnesses of his resurrection. How? Paul said, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I just, I just feel like I'm just now beginning to understand that phrase there. Over and over again, God's Word teaches us that when we really believe in the risen Son of God, that faith can be demonstrated by a life that's changing dramatically, a life that looks more and more like Him over time, and that He is bearing His fruit of His righteousness in our lives over time. It is His creation in us. In Philippians 1, verses 9 to 11, especially verse 11, uh, for time's sake, I'm just going to read verse 11 here, but verses 9 to 11 are in the notes. He says, being filled with the, Philippians 1, 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, for my messianic friends, which are by Yeshua HaMashiach, to the glory and the praise of God. If we claim to be his people, but aren't letting his resurrected life be visible in us, we're guilty of what 2 Timothy 3, 5 calls having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We may look spiritual, we may sound spiritual, we may use spiritual words, we may even speak a little Hebrew or Greek, we may go to the church assemblies, we may sing our psalms and hymns, we may rest on the Sabbath, we have the form of appearance of godliness. But are we exhibiting what Paul called the power of his resurrection? How do we demonstrate the power of his resurrection? By letting him radically begin to change our lives. I confess I haven't uh, let that happen like I should over the years. I've stemmed his, the flow of his Holy Spirit in different ways. And frankly, so have many of you. It starts with a powerful, simple, believing faith and ends with a life that is constantly demonstrating demonstrating faith in Him by what we do. We prove what we believe by what we do. That's true of everything you claim to believe. Our actions bear out what we really believe. If we believe and we say we believe in the risen Christ, our actions should be demonstrating it. If I say I believe I love gardening, and you never see me in the garden, but my Garden of Eden has become the Garden of Whedon, Does that mean I really like gardening? If I claim to really love my wife but treat her with contempt, are my words meaningless then? Yes, they are. We prove what we believe by what we do. 1 John 5.10 says, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who believes in the Son of God, 1 John 5.10 has the witness in himself. If it's been many years since we've repented and been baptized, but really haven't changed that much, can the Son of God be living mightily in us? If I haven't seen someone for ten or more years, and after spending a few hours with them, the last thing I want to hear is, Boy, Philip, nice to see you. I haven't changed a bit. I know they mean well by that, 
But if someone says that, how apparent is the life of Messiah in me? It's far more exciting to me to hear that they thought I'd matured a lot or changed or maybe get an email or a letter to that effect. I'll never forget a phone call I got years back when I was a pastor in Canada. And it was from a Roman Catholic woman I'd never seen or heard from before. On the phone, she said, you don't know me, Pastor, but you know my sister, and she gave her name. My sister used to be selfish. Boy, if you'd seen her before, you'd have no idea, she said. But ever since she started going to your church, she's changed dramatically. And then she started to sob, and then she continued, I want that change. Pastor, whatever you did for her, I want that. I want you to do that for me as well. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> I gave an uncomfortable clearing of my throat. <clears throat> and I said, ma'am, she was crying on the phone. I didn't do anything to her or for her except one thing. I did introduce her personally to her Savior, Jesus Christ. And she's gone through a heartfelt repentance and accepted him as her personal individual Savior. And the change you see in her is the living Son of God living out his righteous life again this time in her. Yes, you can have that same experience if you believe and surrender your old self to him and accept the new life he wants to give you. That, in a nutshell, is what all this is about. She did, and her life changed so much that even a third sister then followed. They were walking testimonies and witnesses of the risen Yeshua. When People change so much, and they exhibit so much of his life, his joy, his way, that others wanted it. That's how we witness to his resurrection, for we are saved by his life, not by his death. We're forgiven by his death. We're justified by his death, but we're made righteous by his life. We're saved by his life. Romans 5.10. <clears throat> Romans 5.10 makes that very clear. So the first and the best way we witness to the risen Messiah is by letting him change our lives. Yes, we should confess him with our mouths, it says that in Romans 10. But first is the changing life. Then our words have some basis, have some power. Your actions speak so loudly I can't hear what you're saying. Ever hear that? Positive actions can speak volumes. Yes, Yeshua lives again in us. And that's why Peter spoke to wives married to unbelieving husbands to let the wives' new lives in Messiah do the speaking and witnessing rather than trying to preach to their husbands. First Peter 3, verses 1 to 3. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands that even if they don't obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your conduct, your chaste conduct, accompanied by fear that they without a word may be won by your conduct. First Peter 3. Slaves were told the same thing in Titus 2, verses 9 to 10. Last one's by Peter. This one's by Paul. Titus 2, verses 9 to 10. He was telling the slaves and employees, if you will, slaves are to be submissive. Titus 2, verses 9 and 10. Titus 2, verses 9 and 10. Slaves, you're to be submissive to your masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back nor stealing or demonstrating or, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn, so that the slaves may adorn the teaching of God our Savior in everything. God our Savior in everything. Adorn it by your actions. We talk too soon. We're given two ears and one mouth to, to remind us to listen twice as much as we speak, I think. We rush verbally to witness to relatives and old friends as we try to explain our new beliefs. We loudly speak out against their false religion. And we put notices on Facebook and we try to open their eyes. This is usually something that will just cause division. It would be better to wait to be asked to explain our new life. Have someone come up to you and say, you know, you're so different. What on, what on earth has happened to you? I'd like to say I've had the hell scared out of me. Because <laughs> that's literally what we should be going through at this point, explain how the risen Messiah is changing your marriage, changing your home, your, your life, your thoughts, your joy, your peace, your finances, your entire life. And that's witnessing. 
okay, we're not a slave, but we're employees. We are spouses. And we need to be letting him live in us. So how do we first witness to the risen Christ? By our lives. Christ, our life. Remember Colossians 3.3. 3. And if we're ever asked, what is Christ like? Or tell me about Yeshua. I want to know more about him. It should be quite easy for us to just point to someone of the other believers. If you want to know what Yeshua was like, is like, hang out with so-and-so over there. She's a lot like him. Yeshua was in the Father, Father was in him, so he was able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We should be coming closer and closer being able to say something similar. Paul did, did in fact, say, follow me as I follow Christ. This isn't about rituals. It's not about what we wear or the sequence of events in a church service and all that. No, brethren, it's not that. It's about our hearts being set on him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I gave a teaching or sermon recently on setting ourselves on him. And then his new life, being lived obediently again in us, shines forth. Turn now to James 2, verses 22 to 24. So this teaching of God's perfect righteousness being imputed to us, though, does not mean, does not mean, must not mean, we can stay the way we've always been. If that were the case, where's the proof of his righteousness we receive by faith, having actually been imputed to us. Where's the proof of the risen Messiah if we stay the way we were? Now, that's the difference between my teaching and what you'll hear in a good Protestant church. Faith must, you know, the Protestants love the uh, Martin Luther doctrine of salvation is by faith alone. It is by faith, but the correct kind of faith, according to James, is able to be demonstrated, like I said earlier about gardening or loving my wife. James 2, verses 22 to 24, do you see that faith was working with his works? Talking about Abraham. And by faith, by works, faith was made perfect. And he ends in verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You're justified by faith, but it's by demonstrable faith, is what James is saying. So, since we receive this perfect righteousness by faith, then we do need to be demonstrating that he is living in us. And so we find in 1 John, so we already heard what James said, in 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. In fact, Jesus said in John 15, I think it's verse 10, that if you love me and abide in my love, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. I think that's what it says in John 15:10. And so he who says, I know him, going back to 1 John 2, verse 4 now, he who says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar. The truth isn't in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. Here's the in him again, over and over again. He who says he abides in him, ought himself also to walk as he walked. Why? Because if you're abiding in him, his life is going to be the evident one. He's going to live righteously all over again. He's going to be changing us. He's going to be helping us overcome the things of the flesh. Our new life, really the Messiah's life in us, isn't passive. The King has come unto you to make your body the temple of His Spirit, of His residence. He wants it to be the Father's house of prayer. He's going to be goading you and prodding you to pray, to come to Him, to, to clean up. He wants your life and body, His house, His temple, to be a clean place of godly worship. So the King is going to actively be cleansing the temple, putting feelings in, inside of you when you're about to sin or, or going in a direction He's not comfortable with. You're going to feel it if you're letting Him live in you. And if you're letting Him guide you and lead you, you're going to follow Him. We're going to be fighting sin. giving. He's going to be giving us the power to resist and overcome. Oh, how I wish I could follow Him more. I'm very carnal much of the time. Paul said he was carnal in Romans 7. For I am carnal, he said. But more and more we should be spiritual, really letting Him live. We will hear feelings and thoughts to do or not do certain things if we listen. 
This will be a process that can move along fairly quickly if we're serious about it, or growth can be slow. It's up to you how much you're letting him flow in you. How much you're letting him flow in you. He is turning you into a perfect replica, an exact image of himself, over time if you stay close to him. Paul says to the Galatians, he was working with them until Christ is formed in you. He said, compare it to a woman in labor pains, until Christ is formed in you. And John the baptizer, he must increase, I must decrease. We should look more and more like him and act and respond and resemble him if he really, truly is living inside of us. Now, that's how my message is different from the others. But brethren, it's different from what's commonly taught in Church of God groups, that there's so much emphasis on works, on obedience, on our own efforts and all of that. And I'm saying, no, the effort is to abide in him. Get out of the way. Let him live. And he will produce his fruit naturally within us. Paul explains then at the resurrection, first John, uh, I mean John does, but Paul does explain that at the resurrection, the corruptible puts on the incorruption. That's when we finally are going to be a hundred percent like him, perfect without spot or wrinkle, without sin, without fault. At the resurrection, the Father takes us all the rest of the way and he finishes. He finishes what he started in us, as Philippians 1.6 says. At that time is when we're going to be able to see Yeshua as he is. In 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has been, not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know this, 1 John 3, verse 2, that when he's revealed, when he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. It's at the resurrection that finally we go all the distance. We go the distance. We are totally now without sin, without fault. We shall be like him, for we, the bride of Christ, at that point shall be one spirit totally with him. We shall be like him, for we are being formed out of the very life and body of the Son of God, just like Eve was out of Adam's flesh and bones. We're joined to the Lord, and we're going to be one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, I read earlier. So why do we still sin then? If perfect, holy, righteous Messiah is in us, why do we still sin? Mostly because we still have this fleshly nature even though we should now also have received the new nature from our Father. The new nature is described in Second Peter 2, I'm sorry, sorry, 2 Peter 1, 2 Peter 1, verse 4, talks about you have now become partakers of the divine nature. Partakers, 2 Peter 1, 4, partakers of the divine nature. So we have human nature or carnal nature called in the flesh, called the old man, the old, the old self. And we have the divine nature called living in the spirit. These two natures in us are almost like a Dr. Jekyll, that was the good, the good side, and Mr. Hyde, the dark side. And that's why good people can still do bad things, including you and me, because we have both natures still. Scripture calls responding to the old self, as living according to the flesh. When we open the door to Yeshua the Messiah and let his mind and actions work in us, we're living according to the Spirit, or in the Spirit. We're flesh and blood, but that's not what it means when it says you're in the flesh or not in the flesh. I don't want to be, by biblical definition, in the flesh. I don't. It has to do with listening to the carnal nature versus listening to the Spirit of the a spirit divine nature we now have. In Romans 8, verses 8 to 9, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, Romans 8, 9, but you are not in the flesh. Oh, we are fleshly, but we're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, 
is not his. So why do we sin? We sin because we give in to the flesh and we let it become dominant. We win when we let the Holy Spirit flow in us and use the Spirit to fight the lust and desires of the flesh. But the, 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 the flesh is so much fun, though. Oh, at least initially there's the temporary pleasures of sin that even Paul talks about in Hebrews 11. The pleasures of sin for a moment. Oh, yeah. It's kind of fun to gossip about someone if you really want to get them. It's kind of fun to indulge in a little bit of flirting or sexual sin when you're right in the moment to watch something you shouldn't be watching. So that's why we sin. We give in to it. It's the easier way. It's explained in depth by Paul in Romans 7, verses 14 to 20, all the way to the end of the chapter 7, in fact. That's where he says that now when he sins, it's no longer I who sin, but sin that dwells in me. His new self wants obedience. But don't get discouraged. This is a process until Messiah is formed in you. Until we become one with him. Until we bear the image of the heavenly. There's a lot of untils in the Bible. Until we come to unity of the faith. All kinds of things. He must increase. I must decrease. That takes time. This time we have the seed of God in us. His very seed of his divine nature. We've known for a long time that genetics often overrides upbringing. I've read stories of twins that were separated. Identical twins separated at birth. And how similar they still were even 40 years later when they were reunited. Same likes, same dislikes, and so forth in many cases. Even though one might have been raised in a very upscale home and one raised in, the, you know, in a lower scale home. We've been given the seed of the very nature of God. We have his genetics, brethren, when we receive this Holy Spirit. That's in 1 Peter 1.23, the seed of God. But we still also have that old nature. And these two are warring against each other. It says clearly in Galatians 6, verses 17, uh, 16 and 17. It says clearly there why we do the things we don't really want to do. In Galatians, I'm sorry, Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. If you turn there with me, I want you to read it in your own Bible if you can. Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the Spirit. Follow the lead of the Spirit. Let Yeshua rule in your life. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I have it up on my wall because I think that's such an important verse. You don't want to sin? Well, let get out of the way and let Jesus live in your life. He never sinned before, and He's not about to now. You sin because you're not letting Him rule in you. When you sin, it doesn't mean you don't have God's Spirit. It does mean, however, that at that moment you listen to the flesh and not to the living Son of God in you. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We will sin when we don't follow the lead of the Spirit. Even King David, after he'd, after he'd killed Uriah and stolen Bathsheba, and was still able to ask and to say, to plead to Almighty God, Take not your Spirit from me, O Yahweh. And he begged for his restoration. He begged for his cleansing, for a new nature. In Psalm 51, the end of Psalm 51, Take not your spirit from me. This was years after the offense. The baby that died was actually a young child by this point in the Hebrew. But sins of presumption, presumption, the in-his-face kinds of sins, the sins that are out-and-out out rebellion, against God. That's another matter. We're in deep, deep trouble with that, according to Hebrews 10, the end of it. Hebrews 10, verses 26 to 31. But Father does understand occasional sins when we stumble due to weakness or ignorance. He's helping us get stronger in Him. He's giving us some time. But we better start listening to Him. But I want to read something in Psalm 103, verses 8 to 14. Psalm 103, verses 8 to 14. We sing this, some of the Church of God groups, page 79 in the hymn book. Yahweh is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. 
He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as heavens are as high as above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgressions from us. This is what I want to really read, Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As the Father pities his children, so the Eternal pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers we're just dust. Psalm 103, verse 14. He knows our frame. He remembers we're just dust. So he's very merciful. But why do we sin? Because we're not letting, at that moment, Yeshua live in our lives. The winning nature in us will be the one we feed and the one we encourage. We have to starve the fleshly nature, feed the divine nature in us. We feed the divine nature by constant contact with our leader and king daily, throughout the day. Prayer, study, listening to him, letting him live his life of good in us. We feed his nature by serving the most helpless, the least of these my brethren. Pitching in when good deeds are called for and are needed. By doing good deeds by his power. Helping people less fortunate than you. As people see our lights shining, as we do his good works, the Father gets glorified. Let your light so shine, let them glorify your Father in heaven as a result. <coughs> We're called to be lights, though, not foghorns. But one thing I want to point out here. Moses, Aaron, and Hur, I think Hur was the husband of Miriam, I think. Learned this in the battle with the Amalekites in Exodus 17. You can read about it if you're not familiar with it in Exodus 17, verses 8 to 13. They're in this battle. Moses climbs up the, the, the hill above the battle. And when, when Moses lifted his arms in supplication to Yahweh, they won. They were winning. But when he got tired or when they let him tire and not reach up, and he put his arms down, quit looking up, they would start to lose in their own efforts. Sometimes, like Aaron and Hur, Aaron and Hur, we have to be humble enough to let others hold up our arms. Sometimes we should be the Aaron and the Hur for someone else who needs our encouragement. When was the last time? That's Jesus Christ walking in you, brethren. If you take the time to send an email to somebody who could just use a, a little comment, I'm praying for you. You're not alone in your trial. Go find your own tiring Moses out there who needs some support and let Yeshua live in you as you do so. By the way, look past your church members. Do it for someone in a different group or someone you work with at work. What a testimony, what a witness to the living, resurrected Son of God that could be. He wins in us when we encourage one another in the way. We pray for one another and we forgive one another. We feed the divine nature as we seek his help in all that we do. The time we wake up, the time we go to bed. We feed that nature when we follow Philippians 4.8. And think on these things, the things that are pure, true, noble, just, pure, lovely. And refuse to think on things that are not of his nature. When we feed on gossip and anger, resentment and bitterness, we're really just damning the flow of the life of the Son of God in us. So get this, brethren, you and I will never sin at any given moment if we would let Jesus rule, our, rule as Lord and Master of our lives every single second we live and breathe, but we don't. Yeshua has never sinned. He is not going to sin in you either. But we sin as we put any distance between him and us and as we don't let him be our new life, Christ our life, hope of glory and all that, when that doesn't happen, we sin. That's just another way of saying Galatians 5.16. We read earlier, walk in the Spirit and you will not sin. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's that simple. Sometimes hard to do, isn't it? But anyway, God now looks down on us. Father looks down on us and he knows that when we sin, it's that old Mr. Hyde nature, not the Dr. Jekyll good guy. It's the old Mr. Hyde nature, so much so that Paul says in Romans 7:17, 7, it's no longer I who sin, but sin that dwells in me. He repeats that in verse 20. Then he finishes Romans 7 and begins Romans 8 by exalting 
in his Savior who will save us from this miserable, failing, fleshly nature that we have. It's all by his Spirit, and it's all to his glory. I can't become righteous enough to be suitable for the kingdom by keeping Torah or the Sabbath and all the things we do. I'm not saying I don't have to obey. I've said already we must. But all of that should not be my focus. My focus has to be faith in his life. Because in Galatians 2.21, it says, For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. I submit that we will be seen as perfect in Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, if we trust in Him, look to Him, and abide to Him to the end. We do have to abide to the end. We do have to listen to Him and for Him, and we do have to obey Him. That's the life. Turn now to Romans 8, verses 3 to 4. That's the life Father now sees. Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of Torah, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Remember when Jesus said, Think not I've come to destroy or, or abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to destroy. I've come to fulfill. And here in Romans 8, 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Again, this is how I differ from the Protestant teaching of this who do not walk according to the flesh. We must no longer walk that way. We must let Him live in us. But as we let Him live, live in us, we will understand that His perfect righteousness is what Father sees. His perfect righteousness is being gifted to me, imputed to me, and I accept it, gladly accept it. So needfully accept it in faith. So when Father sees Philip Shields and sees you, put your name in there. He doesn't see the old you. He sees the son in whom he's well pleased. He sees the son who always did the things that are pleasing to his father. Praise Yahweh. Praise eternal God in heaven, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Peter, and Paul, Praise Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Thank you. Well, how are we going to bear more of that fruit then? Well, the fruit of God's Spirit is simply the life of God's nature in action. The fruit of God's Spirit is letting Jesus Christ live. When we bear the fruit of God's Spirit and not just the fruit of trying to be like God, it's because we're letting Yeshua live. 1 John 4, verses 13 to 16 make it very, very clear that He not only lives in us by His Holy Spirit, we live in God. It says we live in the Son of God and in God the Father there. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. 1 John 4, 15. And we know and we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. He who abides in love abides in God. It's all about love. I know there are some people who say, love, 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 yeah, this yucky, syrupy, love stuff. Well, I'm sorry, that's what the Bible says. I'm not sorry, but that is what the Bible says. It comes down to love. Love in action. In Galatians 5, to 25, we have the list of the fruit, singular, of God's Spirit. One fruit. There are fruits of righteousness, but when it talks about God's Spirit, it's one fruit. One fruit, many parts to the fruit. Have you noticed it says the fruit of the Spirit is? It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit are. The greatest part of that fruit is love. Paul said, walk in the Spirit, feed the Spirit, starve the fleshly natures, walk in the bond of love. 
on love hang all the law and the prophets. So love for God and neighbor defines what the entire Bible is in short. How do we starve the sinful nature? How do you starve anything? Quit feeding it. Our king lives in us by his spirit, and his eyes see, his eyes, uh, his ears hear, whatever you and I are experiencing. Two won't walk together forever lest they be agreed. We shouldn't find pleasure in entertainment, I speak to myself here too, that uses God's name in vain, or promotes sin, or has F words and bathroom words in it all the way through. The Bible's very clear. Uh, let your mouth speak gracious things now. Be salted with grace. And he says, don't have filthy language anymore. Uh, so we, we're not comfortable around people and, and entertainment that pro- uses God's name a lot or promotes sin or adultery, fornication, lying, bare breasts and all that kind of stuff. Come on, brethren. That appeals to the flesh very much so. You bet it does. Murder and so on. But many of us do tolerate that and we pay hard-earned money to be entertained by sinners sinning. I've done it too. Go figure. I do that too often too, and I have to change that. Why should the children of God pay hard-earned money to be entertained by sinners sinning? Or watching them sin? Some of us really like movies. I like some movies once in a while. It's really hard not to pay money to watch sinners sin. In his word, the eternal likens his people to trees where branches... On the vine, he is the vine. He calls Judah an olive tree. He refers to Gentiles as wild olive trees. And then he talks about, I'm the vine and you are the branches in John 15. Have you ever watched plants, even house plants, how they grow towards the light? They need light and they know it. Do we know, like a plant, that we need light and strive to get as much light into our lives as possible? In John 3, verses 20 to 21, it says that the children of the light come to the light, but everyone who practices evil hates light. Now, what's light? We're told in Psalm 119, verse 105, we're told your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. A good tree grows in light, grows towards the light, reaches up towards the light. It'll even bend its branches towards the light if it's, if it's shady in one part. So we need to spend time in the light of His Word daily. Pick up your daily manna. Pick up your Bible. They had to go pick up their daily manna before the heat of the day. I fear too many of us children of God are not getting enough manna, enough light each day. All these different analogies. That's stunting our growth in the fruit of His righteousness that we should be bearing. Now, besides reaching up to the lights, tree roots also grow down into the earth where they can grab water and, and, and food, the different kind of nutrients they need. The water is like God's Spirit. I love that verse in Isaiah thirty-seven thirty-one, which speaks of taking root downward and bearing fruit upward. Isaiah thirty-seven thirty-one. Here's the point I'm trying to get at here, though. Without getting technical... The whole process of capturing light and photosynthesis, pulling up water, producing oxygen, all of that is happening naturally. Remember, we're being likened to branches. The branches of the vine will get what they need from the vine. Ask and it shall be granted unto you, remember? If the branch stays attached to the vine, fruit will come naturally. We're called the branches. The hard work that we're supposed to have and be doing is to stay attached to that vine. Don't let anything rip you off. The vine is not other brethren. The vine is him. One day you look and you see fruit. What most believers seem to be trying to do, though, is trying really hard to be more loving, trying really hard to be more peaceful, really hard to be patient and gentle. But I think that, that I don't think that's Father's righteousness at work, but just your own gutsy effort. If God is at work when we open the doors and, and gates to him, we let his sap of his vine flow. The Holy Spirit, in other words, is flowing in us. It's all going to start flowing naturally and happening naturally. We're going to more naturally become like him. The hard work is done by the vine. Our hard work is to stay attached to him. In John 15, 1 to um, uh, 6, 
it says there, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Uh, if there's any dead wood, any bugs or whatever, he prunes it off that it may bear more fruit. And you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, John 15, 4 to 6 now, and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You see, if I'm not abiding, ab abide means to make him my abode, make him my home. It's my home base. That's where, I that's where I'm hanging out. That's where I'm spending my time. That's where I like to be. Okay, if I'm not doing that, I have effectively detached myself from the vine. If that happens, I cannot bear fruit. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He's not saying the churches, different church organizations are the branches. That's nonsense. You people are the individual branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If you don't abide in me, you're going to be cast out as a branch and is withered and will gather you up, throw them in the fire. So note that the key to bearing fruit is abiding in the vine. Pop back a page to John 14, 23. It's about making the Son of God our abode, our home, and letting his life live in us. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father and I, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's a Father and there's a Son, and they have their Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But here he says, if you love me, you'll keep my word. You'll do what I say. And then Father himself will come with me, and the two of us will be making our home with you by the, by the Spirit, you see. And then 1 John 3:24 says something similar. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. By this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit he's given us. He who keeps his commandments abides in him. So my teaching is different from the Protestant view of imputed righteousness in that if we truly faithfully accept this gift and let the Son's resurrection life empower us today, people are going to be seeing us living obedient lives, changing lives, not uh, pharisaical uh, lives, but, but lives that are full of love and lives full of graciousness and lives full of gentleness. Others will perceive more love, more grace, more obedience, more of all the fruit of his nature. We can't claim he lives in us and keep doing the sinful things we've always done. At some point, Christ has to be forming in us. But take heart, Paul did liken it to a, uh, to a pregnancy, and for the first few months of a pregnancy, you may not even know someone is pregnant. But at some point, it becomes more and more clear there's a new life forming in that woman. In the same way, there should become more and more evident that there's a new life forming in me and in you. I preach to myself. But be encouraged, brethren. The hard work is to keep seeking Him, staying attached to Him, and He will grow in you and me. Make it hard work. Make it a diligent effort, is what I'm trying to say, to make sure that all through the day you find that you're not asleep. We're not like the end-time prophecies, individually anyway, the church being asleep and rich and lazy and fat and all of that. We must pray more. We must study His Word more. We have to listen for Him more and get out of His way more. And we must do the things He's prodding us to be doing. I think many of us are in the precarious position of not abiding. And then we wonder why we're not changing. We wonder why He's not living in us more. I just say, brethren, if that's the case, listen to the sermon I gave about hearing his voice. Part of that abiding means sometimes we have to shut up and just listen quietly, carefully as we pray, um, get a notepad of paper out, and just start listening. We don't have to go to Safeway or other food store and buy a handful of grapes and duct tape them to the grapevine. But that's what some of us are trying to do as we try to produce fruit. We mistakenly provide the fruit and try to make it evident. And that's not the fruit of God's Spirit, but the fruit of our own human effort. It's not the things we do that produces fruit, as is commonly taught. We shouldn't focus on how we'll produce fruit, 
but what we'll do to let his fruit appear in us. It's the fruit of his righteousness, the fruit of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, it says in Philippians 1.11. The tree produces the fruit. The branches, you and me, display the fruit. We're just the branches, his fruit. <laughs> We're just the branches on the tree that is Jesus Christ. When we see lots of fruit, we never marvel at what an awesome branch that is. No, no, we say what an awesome tree that is. Can you see all the fruit tree? Can you see all the fruit on it when the tree is bearing fruit? Are we getting it? It's his fruit, his work. Our work is to stay attached and let him display what he is doing in our lives naturally. This should be obvious, but we don't seem to understand it yet. You and I can't make ourselves look like God or become God. To use another analogy, and many others use in the Bible, he is a potter. who is He is the potter who is shaping this lump of clay that is our lives. He's the one duplicating the, his righteousness in us by his faith. That he gives us and he credits his righteousness to us. But I can, what I can do is make myself available to him to work on this lump of clay, to fashion me to whatever item he chooses. Yeah, we can and we must imitate Christ, but we certainly can become better people by doing that. But, I, but believe me, I believe very much I'll never be able to imitate my way into the kingdom. No, that's still just another variation of works. I've heard entire sermons talking about imitating Christ until we're just like him and qualified to be in the kingdom. That's not grace. That's not even faith. That's not biblical. It is nonsense because you and I can't imitate anything enough on our own to be there. It's going to be a gift. Salvation is a gift. We've been saved by his grace. Part of grace is that he actually graces us with his righteousness. He qualified for the kingdom. Read with me Colossians 1 verses 12 to 13. He qualified for the kingdom and he imputes his righteousness to us who value him who obey him, who abide in him. You should get goosebumps if you really understand what Scripture teaches. As you, as a houseplant reaches up toward the light in the sky, as Moses reached up towards the light with his raised arms, they were given the victory. If you really understand what Scripture is teaching here, get this, brethren. There's only one body that was ever perfect enough as a human being to be in the kingdom of God. Only one body. You and I are now part of his one body. Praise Yahweh and praise Yeshua, his son. In Colossians 1, verses 12 to 13, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. I thought I qualified for the kingdom. Well, Colossians 1, 12 says, I give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. How? In the light. Remember what I said about plants growing towards the light? He has delivered us from the power of darkness. And he has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. He started it and he ended it. I'm almost out of time, so let's do a quick recap of what we covered here today. We reviewed the gift of God's righteousness. It's not just the gift of his grace or forgiveness, but his righteousness. It's apart from the deeds of Torah, it says in Romans 3.21. It's a true gift, not something we earn, not something we do, except to abide in him. As we abide in him, we're going to be letting him live in us, and people will see him. I can't see there being different levels of righteousness in God's family. No, there's going to be one level of righteousness allowed, the Father's own perfection, that will cover all, everyone in the, in, in, in the kingdom. Among humans, some can be more righteous than others, but in the end, we all fall, fall short, and so we have to be covered by his perfection. That has to be reckoned, credited, imputed to us. Hebrews 11 and so many other chapters talk about it's the same righteousness everyone had. Uh, Enoch, Abel, all, Noah, everybody. We're part of the body of Adam. Uh, we're part of the body of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're holy, and as we're part of him, we're more and more like him. We've been called to be witnesses of his resurrection and the power of that resurrection in a very real way, transforming us. He lives in us. And that power and that resurrection is the main witness instead of our 
uh, at least initially, instead of our words, and then people will come and ask us about these changes, then we can explain. We still sin because of two natures, and whoever, whichever nature we listen to is the one that wins, and the key to producing fruit is to abide in him and let him flow. I'm out of time. Let's read Philippians 1.6.